Take your Bibles, please, and open with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. You're aware that when there's some newsworthy event, whether it would be a, a war in Gaza or a protest somewhere or some politician got elected or de-elected or whatever, the, the news organizations scurry around with their microphones to get reactions. So you see it all the time. They'll hold the microphone up to, to somebody and say, this just happened. What do you think about that? Uh, and it might be interesting. I think some of the silliest I've, I've seen, uh, I used to follow baseball quite a little bit. I haven't really much in many years, but uh, after a team wins a baseball game, the, new, uh, the sports reporter would go and say to the, the winning side, how do you guys feel about this? Well, what are they supposed to say, you know? Uh, you know, we feel great, we, we beat them, you know? And then they go to the losing side, how do you guys feel? Oh, well, we're kind of bummed. Uh, well, you know, but reactions. And this morning, what we're going to do, in, in your mind's eye, in your, in your heart now, you can think about this, we're going to invite certain people and groups of people to come and sit here, and we're going to ask them some very significant news happened this Sunday morning. Something amazing occurred. There is a tomb in a garden just outside Jerusalem, and when some people went to check on it early this morning, they discovered that the, the, the stone, a great big large rock, round, had been rolled back, and the dead body that had been inside is gone. And we hold up our microphone and say, what do you think about that? So this morning, we're going to be getting reactions to Christ's resurrection from three groups of people, the guards and the priests, first of all, and then the women, and then finally the disciples. So those three groups of people we're going to interview by means of the scriptures and ask, re react to this, respond to this news, and tell us what's going on in your mind and your heart. So first of all, the guards and the priest here in Matthew chapter 28, please look with me at verse 11. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you were to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Now, of course, the, the backdrop for this uh, bribery, this cover-up, this scandal, uh, the backdrop is back in the early part of this chapter, Matthew 28, uh, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, the first day of the week, as you know, Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave, and there had been a severe earthquake when an angel came down from heaven, and he rolled the stone away from the entrance to the tomb. There's an earthquake, and the guard uh, were so stunned by the appearance of angels and the earthquake, they fainted. They tipped over. It says they became like dead men. Uh, now, I think the guard that's being talked about here are not Jewish soldiers, the temple guard. I think that they're probably Roman legionnaires because you remember that the Sanhedrin went to Pilate and said that deceiver, meaning Jesus, said, after three days I will rise again. So Pilate, we want you to give us a guard and set a security detail on the tomb so that they can't come and steal the body. And so I think that the guard that's being talked about here is uh, Roman legionnaires, and they've been lent to the Jewish leadership to secure the site of the tomb, and Pilate even sent along his seal. So the seal would be either a cylinder seal, it's a little cylinder that you put on a rope around your neck, 
and it's a small uh, thing made out of ceramic, sometimes stone, and you would take that and roll it in wet uh, wax, warm wax or, or clay, and that seal indicates that there's ownership and authority involved. And so this is probably Pilate's own personal seal indicating I am the governor, I represent the Roman government, the emperor in Rome appointed me, and I represent all the power and all the authority and all the jurisdiction of the Roman Empire. So anybody that comes across this tomb and you see the soldiers guarding it, you just back off because this is Roman property. This is under seal by the authority of the government of the Roman Empire. So these guards are assigned this duty, and it'd be interesting, wouldn't it, to, to find out what they were thinking. Were they thinking this is a piece of cake, this guard did, were they thinking it was silly, these silly Jews with their superstitions and so on. Be interesting to find out what they were thinking, but we're not told. They were just guarding the tomb. And then early in the morning, before dawn, these events took place, an angel out of heaven rolling the stone away, accompanied by a big earthquake. And then, you can picture it, can't you? The guards see men-like figures, apparently in shining, glowing garments, coming towards them, and uh, they're not prepared for that and they tip over in a dead faint. And then of course, as Mary and uh, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary come, and eventually Peter and John, <clears throat> while all that is going on, uh, the women coming to the tomb, the disciples coming, going back and forth, while that is going on, the guards have awakened, discovered that the dead body that was in the tomb is no longer there, and they're headed back, and they go, first of all, to the, the Jewish leadership, the chief priests and the, the, the leadership of uh, the religious sector of, of Judah, they go to them and say, here's what happened. We've never experienced anything like this in our lives. We were scared. Uh, we were scared witless. And in fact, we fainted. They explain this to the Jewish leadership and the response of the Jewish leadership is, here's what we're gonna do. We have a little fund, <laughs> uh, and we're going to share it with you. We're going to give you some money. And uh, you, you just say it like this. Uh, it, was, it was dark. It was quiet. We were tired. We got sleepy. We fell asleep. And I guess the disciples of this guy came and broke into the tomb and took the body while we were sleeping. That's the official story. That's the cover-up. But as Matthew says there in verse 15, this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Intriguingly, about 100 years after the time of Jesus, there was an early church father by the name of Justin Martyr, and he wrote a lengthy letter to a man called Trypho the Jew. And in that letter, Justin Martyr uh, said about you, the Jews, you disseminated this false story, and it's being propagated everywhere, all over the ancient Middle East. The Jewish people have been telling this story, but it is not true. And he debunked all the legends and the superstitions and the stories. Actually, it didn't take. Justin Martyr's uh, rebuttal didn't work well because several hundred years later, in the Middle Ages, there was a, a, a booklet published by Jews that said all these things. It said, yes, there was a Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, he was a great teacher. Yes, he performed miracles. But he died, and then his disciples stole his body, his dead body, out of the tomb. This lie was propagated over hundreds and hundreds of years. Folks, did you know that there is a great deal of importance in how you respond to the truth? Uh, 
the old nature, the human beings, were built in such a way that if truth, facts, information, truth comes to us, but it's going to upset our worldview. It's going to turn things upside down in our minds. There's a very strong probability that we're going to try to get, up, get away from that truth. In fact, we might deny it altogether and come up with an alternative reality. And that's what's going on here. You know, uh, how you respond to the truth is a big deal. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church in Galatia, said, I'm telling you the truth about the gospel, about what it means to be uh, committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be a disciple of the Lord. And he says, have I now become your enemy because I've told you the truth? That can happen, can't it? If we respond the wrong way to the truth, we're deluding ourselves, we're lying to ourselves, we're creating a false reality. And that is what's going on here. The guards and the priest colluded. They conspired together to come up with a false story so that the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ would not be known. So how do you respond to the truth? Well, the truth is this. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did actually go to the cross of Calvary voluntarily, and he took upon himself our sin, your sin. And God the Father punished him, not for anything wicked that he had done, but for our sin. And he died. That was the punishment from God, his death in our place. But he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose out of the tomb, and he is alive today in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. That's the truth. That's the reality. Friend, if you're here today, and you have never believed the truth, the reality, the facts, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, and rose again. If you have never believed, if you have never accepted the truth of that story, you do not actually have a relationship with God. You do not have, you, you don't have any right to call God your Father. You do not have the privilege of calling upon Him in prayer and asking for help. You are not a part of God's family, and your eternal destiny is not heaven. That's the truth. What will you do with the truth? I can think of no better day than Easter Sunday, 2024, to believe what Jesus did for you. If you believe in Jesus as your Savior, if you believe that he dealt with your sin problem once for all, then in fact, you are part of God's family, your sins are forgiven, and your eternal destiny is secured, that is, in his presence forever. What will you do with the truth? The guards and the priests conspire to cover it up, deny it, debunk it, get rid of it. Of course, they're not successful because even today, people are believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, the guards and the priests propagated this self-contradictory story, uh, and it turned into something that had a life of its own for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, go with me to John's Gospel, please. John chapter 20. We were here a few minutes ago for our scripture reading, and we find next the women. John chapter 20. So we're told in verse 1 of John 20, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, they're coming to the tomb. Uh, Jesus' body had been put into the tomb in haste. 
because the preparation day and the high holy day were coming very, very rapidly. There wasn't time to do uh, what they would normally do, uh, to wash the body, put spices in a long linen wrap and so on. Uh, they, they hadn't had time to do that. So they're coming now, even after he's been buried uh, in the ground for three days. They're coming now to do that uh, out of respect and honor for him. But when they get to the tomb, the stone has been rolled away and there are no guards. And this causes great puzzlement to them. Uh, and so Mary sees that you know, the, the, the tomb has been disturbed. There's no dead body inside. So she, Mary Magdalene, I remember that she is a woman out of whom Jesus had cast many demons. She's a former demoniac. And Mary Magdalene runs back to where she knows the disciples are in verse 2. And she talks to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John, the author of this gospel. And she says, <clears throat> I can't believe it. Somebody robbed the tomb. This is awful. We were going there to pay our respects. Somebody has taken the dead body of our Lord. And they report this to Peter and John. And so they run together, verses 3 and 4. And there's even this little included detail. The two are running together. The other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter. Uh, John was much, much younger. He was probably the youngest of the disciples. Peter may well have been the oldest. So I can testify that younger men can indeed run faster than me. <laughs> and John got there first, and uh, he looked. And, and then Peter, verse 5, Peter arrived just after John. Good old Peter, he's not content to just look at the doorway and see the stone and say, okay, something has happened here. Good old Peter, he's got to see it for himself. He goes right in there. And he sees uh, there's a bench probably on the left side of this little cavity. And the bench would be where the body was laid. And so Peter stoops down and looks in. Uh, verse 6, Peter came also and he entered the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head not lying with the linen wrappings but rolled up in a place by itself. So there was a body wrap that ran around the, the whole body. And then there's another wrap that goes just around the head. And that one has been taken off and folded and rolled neatly, set down. If the body had been stolen, they would not have undone the wrappings. The, the, the wrappings and the way that they're laid there are evidence that something else has happened. The body was not stolen. And it says in verse uh, 8, the other disciple who had first gone, that's John, came to the tomb, then also entered, and he saw and believed. So things begin to click for John when he sees the arrangement of the linen wrappings, and he understands this is not somebody stole the body, or the Romans, or the high priest did something, they took it away. That's not what this is. It's almost as if the body kind of came through the cloth. And now the cloth is no longer needed. It's just there. And John begins to understand, begins to click in him. He believed. So the disciples go away. But we're left with Mary, Mary Magdalene, in verse 11. And she has come back after getting word to Peter and John. She's come back to the garden. And she's standing outside the garden, uh, outside the tomb, rather. And she's crying. She's weeping. She, she loves Jesus because he changed her life from a demoniac into a woman of value and worth. And now they've taken away the body. The, the one opportunity she had to honor him and respect him and, and show her worship to the Lord, and now the body's gone. Isn't this a touching scene? That this, and I find it absolutely fascinating. You've got 11 apostles, Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, all, those, all the apostles. Uh, you've got high-powered people like Nicodemus, 
and Joseph of Arimathea, they're probably on the Sanhedrin. You've got lots and lots of other people, but the first person to see the resurrected Christ is Mary Magdalene. Now, you picked up on it there. She doesn't even know what she's looking at. It does say in verse 11 that she was weeping. So maybe her, her vision was blurry. Or maybe she's just, it's locked into her head. They've, they've stolen the body. When she turns around and sees Jesus, her first thought is, he's the gardener. He's the caretaker. And so she, she says to him, when he says to her, woman, why are you weeping? She says in, in verse uh, 13, because they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. And as she turns around, she sees Jesus, and Jesus asks, uh, why are you weeping? Whom, whom are you seeking? Verse 15, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And then I love this in verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. And now she knows him. I wonder if we believers, those of us who have trusted Christ as Savior, when we step through that doorway into the presence of our Lord, I wonder if the first word we hear is our name spoken by his lips. And in that moment, we'll know him. We'll know who it is. We'll understand. He's the one who died for me. He's the one who rose again. And there's a, a deep personal connection. Do you see that here? This is a very wonderful portrait of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, caring for a woman who's had a tough life, but now she belongs to him. Beautiful, just a, a, a beautiful picture. And God's grace to Mary, even though she had not yet figured out what was happening, or even what her emotions should be, God's grace to Mary was that she was the first one to see the, the resurrected Christ. And so here are, here's a portrait of the women. Go with me uh, right here in John 20 as well. The third group of people from whom we desire to get a reaction is the disciples. And so we've got John and Peter. We read that earlier in chapter 20, verses 4 through 9. Word comes to them via Mary Magdalene. They run to the tomb. Uh, Peter goes right in and sees it. John goes in after him and sees the, the grave clothes. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the headpiece by itself is what sealed the deal for John. Uh, and they come back and they report to all the others, the Lord has been, been raised from the dead. He's not dead. And you know, I can imagine uh, they're struggling with this concept. Yes, the Bible does teach resurrection. Yes, you can find it in the Old Testament. But for them personally to grapple with this was a hard thing. It, it did not come naturally to them to understand Jesus has overcome death. Remember, we get to read the whole New Testament. They can't read it because it hasn't been written yet. It's not available to them yet. So, so we get the advantage of reading all the Gospels and all the stories, and we can combine them and, and parse them out. They don't have that advantage. Here's another representative of the disciples. Here, right here in John 20. Please look at verse 24. Verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So this is in the upper room, and this is where Jesus comes through the door, the door being shut. Uh, the implication is that he, you know, if, if you want to use the word translocated, he's, he's able to move through solid objects at will, apparently. He came into that place and presented himself to them, and uh, most of the disciples were there, but Thomas was not. He was not present. And so the next week, uh, after the other disciples have been talking to Thomas, you won't believe this, Jesus is alive. We've seen him. 
And we all know the story, don't we? Thomas says in verse 25, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So uh, <clears throat> I guess Thomas would be science-based or fact-based or something. <laughs> uh, he says, I gotta see it. Yeah, I, you gotta prove it to me, because this business of resurrection, uh, that, that's a little hard to swallow. Now, he's been a faithful follower, but the, the physical resurrection is tough for him to get at. So the next week, verse 26, after eight days his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Now this, this is pretty interesting too, isn't it? Jesus is so gentle. Aren't you grateful that, that God is gentle? You know, he, he could have said, uh, Thomas, you rascal, didn't I teach you for three and a half years? Don't you get it, you laggard? That's not what he said. He says to Thomas, reach here with your finger, see my hands, reach here your hand, put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Believe. Here I am, Thomas. You want proof? Here you go. He's very gentle, but very clear, very pointed. And he says, Thomas, this is the real deal. Now, we all, we all know, we've, we've read, we've heard messages about doubting Thomas. We know all about this. May I suggest to you that Thomas may have struggled with this, but his response to the truth is excellent. So, in verse 20, uh, 28, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Actually pretty similar to Mary Magdalene when she says Rabboni, that means my teacher. There's a personal ending on it, my teacher, you belong to me. And here Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Not only is he believing, he is also saying, you have my loyalty for my whole life. I am yours. I am yours to command. I belong to you. And Thomas is evidencing uh, very clearly that his allegiance, his trust, uh, his obedience is going to be to Jesus Christ for the rest of his life. What are the reactions to the resurrection of Christ? We hold the microphone up to the Jewish leadership and the guards. Oh, well, that never happened. His disciples came and stole the body. A denial of the truth. The women, how about the women? What's your reaction? We were there. Mary Magdalene says, I talked to the angels. I talked to Jesus. He said my name. We asked the disciples, what's your reaction to the resurrection of Christ? He is alive. We saw him. And he is our Lord and our God. He has all of our obedience. He has all of our allegiance for the rest of our lives because he has overcome sin and hell and death and Satan, he's the Lord and he's alive. Friends, let me ask you, what's your reaction to the resurrection of Christ? Are you like the guards and the priests? No, 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 didn't, never happened. Well, that would be a denial of the truth. That would be believing a lie. Would it be like the, the, the women? Rabboni, I, I've seen him, I've, I've knelt at his feet, I've touched his feet, he's alive. Well, I hope so. And I actually hope that your response would be encapsulated in the same form as Thomas, my Lord and my God. Because, friends, 
Jesus is risen. He has come back alive from the dead. He has conquered the sin issue once and for all. And whether we acknowledge it or not, he is our Lord and our God. And he desires the very best for our lives. He desires fulfillment and important things to do for his glory. And if we acknowledge, if we believe and obey, we can participate in this great program as well. So we have the truth. We have the, the reality of the resurrection. It's been recorded indelibly in Scripture and imprinted on our hearts as well. Thank you for being with us. We have lunch downstairs in just a few minutes and uh, later on a brief afternoon service up here. Please stand with me. We'll dismiss in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ and therefore our own resurrection in the future is a reality. And we thank you that uh, the power of God overcomes even death. Uh, so, Father, help us to respond the right way to this truth. Uh, may it uh, sink deep into our souls and cause us to, to respond the same way that Mary did, the same way that Thomas did. Uh, Lord, may we give to you our, our faith, our trust, and our obedience forever. Bless us today. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. We are dismissed.